Well, I want to begin by sharing the importance of motivation. Now, I've tried to share with you from the very beginning of this that there's, it takes three things to do any job well. First, you have to be properly motivated. Secondly, you have to be properly equipped. And thirdly, there has to be some manifestation of success in the pursuit that you're after. And God understands that and he has provided gifts for his church that allow us to participate in all of those things. Now, we've been looking exclusively at that first set of gifts. We've been looking at motivational gifts and they are so very important. I've gone through all seven of them with you. Now, I just want to, maybe you're, maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I just, I just don't know. I look at these gifts and you've explained them, but I don't know really what my gift is. I'm just having a hard time being able to identify my motivational gift. Well, if you have trouble identifying that gift, I have an illustration that I promise will help you to see this more clearly. Now let's suppose your family is having Thanksgiving dinner and when the dinner is complete, one of the children in the household, a pie is brought and set on the table ready to be divided up uh, and suddenly one of the children leaps up and knocks the pie off of the table onto the floor. Now, how do you respond? This is the issue. What will your response be? Now, if your dominant gift is prophecy, your first response, the first thing out of your mouth will be, I told you that was going to happen. Now, it doesn't matter whether you told them or not. If you're a prophet, that's just the first thing you say. I told you that was going to happen. Now, the servant, on the other hand, will say, here, let me clean it up. See the difference? But the exhorter will say, next Thanksgiving, let's provide an additional table. Now the giver will say, oh, I'll go out and buy another pie. The administrator will say, Susie, go get a mop. Jerry, go get a wet rag. Sally, bring the trash basket. Then the empathizer will say, that's all right, honey, as she's patting the little child. It's all right. It could happen to anyone. Now, somewhere in those seven gifts, you fit. And if you look at your response to this, it'll help you identify your dominant gift. You fit in to this pattern in one way or another. One of those is your dominant gift. Now, let me say this. You will never be a complete Christian without knowing what gift is yours. Unless you understand your dominant gift, you're never going to be complete. In other words, you'll never be properly motivated to serve God and his church. Not until you understand that dominant gift. Now, I want to look at the second necessity for the remainder of today. And that necessity is being properly equipped. It doesn't do you any good to be motivated if you're not properly equipped to use that gift. You see my point? For us to do any task well, whether it be physical or spiritual in nature, we must have the following characteristics. We must not only be properly motivated, but we must be properly equipped and we must see manifestations of progress in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Those things are essential and they're absolutely and completely crucial to us. Now, let me repeat for the third time. There can be no success in any assigned task if a person is not properly equipped. And that is especially true of Christians. So God has provided, now get this, 11 ministry gifts to equip us, to equip all of us for our ministries. Now, those with these equipping gifts are assigned the task of training the members of the body of Christ for the everyday work of the ministry. You see, the Bible teaches that every born-again Christian is a minister. 
In other words, what I'm saying to you is we Protestants believe in the priesthood of believers. Every believer in Jesus Christ who is born for a second time has a calling into the priesthood. And a priest will not be able to minister without utilizing his or her God-given gifts. I'm talking about the seven motivational gifts. Now let me repeat. Those believers having one or more of these 11 ministry gifts will help prepare those in the body to minister effectively within the congregation. That is their task. And in that way, every person in a congregation will work together to build a strong and thriving church. Now, those who have received one or more of these ministry or equipping gifts are often referred to as being, are you ready? Ordained ministers. That is what sets those with equipping gifts aside. It is their ordination. So let's look at each of these equippers. The first five ministry or equipping gifts are listed in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12. Now these verses read as follows. And he, now the he here is capitalized if you notice in your Bible, and he, meaning the Father, himself. Now, this is placing the emphasis on the Father. There is something the Father does that is unique when it comes to gifting. And he, meaning the Father, himself gave, gave some, now does it say all? No. Now, when we looked at the motivation gifts, it says to all has been given. But now, here is the word some. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why has he given us these people? What is it that he has given us? For the equipping of the saints. Now, who are the saints? You are. You are. For the equipping of the saints to do what? Why does he equip the saints? Why does he equip the body? For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. God has set aside some, you see, and one of those, and those people are divided up into five different areas. See, it's like the fingers on your hands. These ministry gifts are called the fivefold gifts. Now, they're like your fingers, the five fingers on your hand. What is the function of your fingers? What are they for? It is to serve the hand. And as we know that when a finger is missing, the hand does not perform to its maximum extent. Now, in the church, the fingers are those with equipping gifts, and the hand itself is Christ. These five ministries serve Christ and the body, which is the remainder of us, all of you included. Now, believe me, these gifts are essential to the well-being of any church. They are absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial. So let's look at these five major ministry gifts individually. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, the Apostle Paul lists these five major gifts without which the church cannot thrive. I just read them to you a moment ago, but I want to give them to you again. Here they are, the five. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. There is the five-fold gifting. But now, you say, Pastor, is that all the equipment? No, no, no. You see, there are also six Minor, those are the major, those five are the major, but there are six minor ministry gifts. And the presence of these ministries will enrich any church in which they're allowed to operate. Believe me, they work alongside those five major gifts and are spelled out for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. Now that verse reads as follows. Listen carefully now. And God, who? God has appointed these in the church. First, apostles. Now, we've seen that before, haven't we? 
Secondly, prophets. We've seen that before. Thirdly, teachers. We've seen that before. They're in those fivefold gifts. But then he goes on with this. Miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Now listen to what that said. Variety of tongues. Then later, in 1 Corinthians 12, 30, the apostle adds another gift that is suggested here. Paul does this by asking two questions. He asks this, do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Now, in the Greek, if you read Greek the way I do, you understand this is the implied negative. The answer is no, it's already there for you. Not everyone speaks in tongues and not everyone interprets. In other words, the gift of the interpreter of languages is inferred by these two questions. So here's a list of these six gifts. Let me give them to you again. These are the minor gifts. Miracle workers, healers, helpers, administrators, speakers in tongues, and the interpreters of tongues. So for all the gifts that we've examined, now we've spent all of these several weeks on the motivation gifts, Remember now, they are called charismata in the Greek. They are the charismatic gifts, charismata. But these 11 gifts that I just shared with you are not charismata. They are known as domata. In other words, the domatic gifts. Now, the Greek word domata carries the sense of being appointed or being, get this, set aside for certain positions. In reality, the word domata describes a state of being divinely selected. That, the, that is the distinction of the domata. It demonstrates the fact that God often chooses people like me, undeserving persons, to serve him, and he grants to us special giftings to minister in one of the 11 different ways. Now, for example, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 that I just shared with you, the apostle tells us that God personally sets aside those with domatic gifts, that is, ministry gifts, to do what? To serve the church. That is their task. They are to serve the church. Now, the Greek word translated into English as sets, in the phrase sets aside, is the, is the verb atheto. E-T-H-E-T-O, etheto. Now, the wording of 1 Corinthians 12, 28 makes it obvious that not everyone in the church has been given a domata. You see, only a select group are given ministry gifts. In other words, only certain believers have set aside to be the equippers of the saints for the work of the ministry. Not everybody fits into that category. And once a domata has been bestowed upon a person, as God did upon me, God never takes that appointment away. I've told some of you before, and you've heard it, but it, it uh, pays to go back over these things at times. When I first entered the ministry, I'd been a pastor for probably six years, and no one was getting saved. I didn't understand spiritual gifts. I, I didn't know about domatas and charismata. I did, I, all of this was just Greek to me at that time. And so I kept wondering myself, why does nobody ever get saved? Why are, not, why are people not flooding to the altars because I'm preaching these sermons and boy, I waxed evangelistic and all these things. Nobody, week after week after week after week. I, I just didn't understand. So finally I said, I'm getting to the bottom of this. So I go in in front of the altar of the church in Lamont, Oklahoma, and I threw myself on the floor, spread my arms out. I looked like Luther. And I said, God, I'm not getting up until you tell me what's wrong here. Well, I laid there for like four hours. Nothing, nothing. And finally I said, God, please speak to me here. And beloved, God spoke to me just as clearly as one of the several times that God has really spoken aloud to me. And God said to me, get up off that floor. I have called you 
not to be a proclaimer of the word. I've got Billy Graham to do that. I've called you to be an explainer of the word. Now get up and start explaining my word to people. Well, after that, I had no more problem because I found out what my ministry was, my domata. I'm a natural born teacher. That's, that's what God set me aside, called me and gifted me to be and do. And now you're listening to me because that teaching resonates with you. Now, God will never let that domata pass away from me. It's irrevocable. I can remember a friend of mine one time who was in the ministry, had a fantastic ministry in the United Methodist Church. He's just a fabulous person. But he got himself uh, out of the word and into some other stuff. And before very long, he was doing things the world's way. And he, uh, it made me so sad. But one Sunday morning, I've been praying for him. And one Sunday morning, I look up and bless your life, there he is sitting back there in the middle of my congregation. I just stopped right in the middle of my sermon. I looked at him and said, listen, I want to see you after church. You come to my office. Well, after church, he came to my office. Now, understand this. We'd been friends for 15 years. And I looked at him and I said, what are you doing with your life? He said, oh, I own this and I own that and I go here and I go here and I do that. And I said, you can't do that. He said, what do you mean you can't do that? I said, because you've been given a domata. You've been given a ministry gift. You're supposed to be an evangelist. That's what God has called you to do. And you can't escape it. And don't you even try. Well, he walked out of my office. My wife, Chris, is here listening to me. And she can remember this. My telephone rings that afternoon. And it's this guy. He said, Nick, I was heading back for Tulsa. He said, and all of a sudden, that scripture, I knew what you were saying to me because that scripture came to me. The gifts and the calling of God is without revocation. It can't be revoked. You can't escape it. He said, I just pulled my car over my Cadillac, got out of the car, walked around the car, got over in the passenger side, got down on my knees in the floor of that car. I said, God, whatever you got for me, if I haven't messed it up, Whatever you got for me, I'll do what you want me to do. Well, the truth of the matter is, I'm so, I was so excited that he did that, but he couldn't help it because he had a gift he couldn't rid himself of. He couldn't do anything else because once you have been called into an office like this, that call is on you forever. It can't be renounced. Now, listen, that, here, here's the scripture passage. Romans 11.29, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Now, beloved, my major point is this. We must recognize that these 11 gifts appear in both natural and supernatural modes. Now, clearly, those who exercise these 11 ministry gifts in a supernatural way must have divine assistance before their gifts will be effective. Now, I'm not suggesting you go out and do this on your own. It takes, these are gifts of the Holy Spirit. It takes the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to allow you. I have to have the Spirit's empowerment to be an explainer of the truth. I can't do that on my own. I'm not that smart. See, all of these things are purely supernatural in origin. Now, that's true of all the charismatic gifts. Every charismatic gift is absolutely and completely supernatural in origin. But now, the domata is slightly different. See, they often operate with a natural, supernatural balance. In other words, if you can't speak publicly, God is not going to call you to be a prophet. Hello? God may call you to be a pastor, but he's not going to call you to be a prophet. A person's natural talents will often play a key role in the operation of these various ministry gifts. So these are the qualities of each of those major, those five major ministry gifts. Let me give them to you at one time. The ministry of the apostle. Let's begin there. The first one, this one. The first major ministry 
is that of the apostle. So what is an apostle? What is an apostle? Well, it comes from the Greek noun apostolos. Apostolos, or here's, here's what it means. Sent out one. Are you with me? An apostle is what? A sent out one. Now, these persons have been those who are set aside by the church and gifted by the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to where it has not previously gone and establish churches in that area. That is the apostle. Now, I hope... Maybe, I may, maybe, maybe that needs to be said again. These persons have been set aside by the church and gifted by the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to places where it has not previously gone and to establish churches in those areas. Now, sometimes we call those people what? Yes, you're right. We call them missionaries. Missionaries. Now, this calling to be an apostle, I consider to be the highest of all the callings, since an apostle must incorporate all five major ministry gifts in his apostolic uh, efforts. Now, these are some of the roles of the apostle. An apostle must be an evangelist. In other words, one of his callings is to win the loss to Christ. But that's not all. He must also be a prophet, challenging new converts to walk in the way and in the will of God. Oh, but that's not all either. He must also be a teacher. He must disciple new converts and teach doctrinal correction and correctness. He must be, eventually be a pastor, caring for the needs of the congregations he establishes. Can you see all of the other four gifts are found in this fifth gift, the gift of the apostle. Now, this gift is most often bestowed today on those, as I said a moment ago, who would be missionaries since they must all perform, since they must perform all of these roles. Now, throughout the history of the church, from the very beginning, God has always bestowed extraordinary powers on those that he calls and sets aside to be apostles. I want you to think about that for a minute. Scriptures tell us that various signs and wonders, when God set a person aside, he enabled them to do signs and wonders. Why? Scripture is very clear. To authenticate their calling. That's how you knew they had the gift. And this is true of modern apostles. The signs that often accompany their ministries grant them credibility in the sight of those who have not heard the gospel preached before. Now, what is their first task? What's the very first thing? It's to help equip the saints for the work of the ministry. You see, they are set aside, apostles, to teach Christians the full operation of the power of God. And that is especially evidenced through the laying on of their hands. God has made that arrangement that somehow or another, those with this gift, when they touch other people, miraculous events follow, signs and wonders. In addition, apostles are usually anointed with all nine manifestation gifts. Now, we haven't covered those yet, but we're going to cover those after we finish with the equipping gifts. So just put that in your, in your bag and, and wait for us to get there. So... They're especially anointed in the gifts of healings and miracles, in those sub-dominant gifts. Now, what about the ministry of the prophet? Well, those who've been called to the ministry role of the prophet are those persons who've been set aside and gifted, and gifted to boldly proclaim the word and will of God. Now here's the key. Here's what separates them from others. Here's what separates a prophet. To, they've been set aside and gifted to boldly proclaim the word and the will of God mainly to the church. See, prophets are called to the church. 
That is to twice born believers. That is their audience. Is those who have been born again. Now prophets are also endowed with an urgency to renounce evil. They, they're just, listen, a prophet recognizes evil when nobody else thinks a thing about it. They have that God-given gift of being able to sense that. Now, the ministry of the prophet is usually twofold. In the first place, they are encouragers of the church. That's the greatest thing a prophet does, is he encourages believers, makes them strong in the Lord. That's, that's their calling. And they even can affect people outside the church, calling them to examine themselves and re repent of their sins and wickednesses. Now, when it comes to the equipping of the saints, the prophets have three primary tasks. Listen carefully. First, to equip those with the, motion, with the motivational gift of prophecy. Now, if that's your dominant motivational gift, a prophet, a person with the ministry of the prophet, will help you to effectively proclaim the gospel. They, will, they just have a tendency to take people with the motivation gift of prophecy and develop them where God can use them to strengthen the body. In the second place, a good prophet, one that God has set aside and put this calling upon, will encourage all believers in the church in their ministries and in their walks with God. They have that ability. And then thirdly, they help equip motivated exhorters to encourage discouraged and defeated saints. How many times have I seen a prophet in the church go to some person with the motivational gift of the encourager, of the exhorter, and say, look, I notice this person, that person, they're struggling right now. Why don't you go to them? And that is encouragement to the exhorters to do the job God has called, set them aside to do. Well, you say, Pastor, that's very interesting. What about the ministry of the evangelist? Well, those who have been called to the ministry of the evangelist have been gifted to vocally proclaim the word and will of God. Now, here's the difference between an evangelist and a prophet. Are you ready? They have been called the evangelist to declare the word and will of God primarily to the unsaved. Prophets speak primarily to the saved. Evangelists speak primarily to the unsaved. They are proclaimers. Are you with me? They are proclaimers of the word of God. And their ministries will often take them from one place to another. Now, as most of you who know me well know, my father was an evangelist and traveled all of his life except for those few years he would settle down to pastor to catch his wind and to give my sister and I a place where we could go to school for a while. Now, but what I found about evangelists is this. They're most often driven to go to places where non-believers are found. One of the greatest of all of evangelists that I've ever seen of, the, of, of this variety with the domatic gift of evangelism is Dr. Harry Denman. I had the honor of receiving his award for the Oklahoma Annual Conference one year, the Denman, the Denman Evangelism Award. Never anything meant more to me than that, but I remember one time being in Memphis, Tennessee, preaching a revival, and the church put me up in a place called the Claridge Hotel. Maybe some of you might remember the Claridge. I don't even know whether it's still there or not, but there was a very famous tavern down in the basement of that hotel called the Bell Tavern. Well, while I was there, I was sitting in the lobby and a young man came over to me and he said, uh, are you the Methodist pastor that's staying with us? And I said, yes, I am. He said, did you ever know Dr. Harry Denman? And I said, no, I, I, I didn't know him, but I, I know of him. <laughs> he's, a, he, he's one of the great saints of all time. And the fellow said, I'd like for you to do something with me. So he took me downstairs into the Bell Tavern and there was a man behind, the, the bartender was behind the bar and 
This young fellow said to the bartender, he said, this is a Methodist pastor. He's here. He knows about Harry Denman. He said, oh, Dr. Denman saved my life. And I said, well, how did he do that? And he said, well, one night this fellow came in. He sits down very close to where you are. And I went over and said, can I help you? And he looked me right in the eyes and he said, yes, I'm in desperate need. He said, raised his voice. You can hear him halfway around the hotel. Yes, I'm in desperate need. The guy said, well, what do you need? He said, I need somebody to pray for me right now. He said, I'm a bartender. He said, I can't pray for myself. I, how am I going to pray for you when I can't pray for myself? He said, you can pray for me if you really cry. No, I can't. I, he said, this, yeah, I don't pray. He said, why not? And he said, then Dr. Denman started in. He said, before he left that bar that night, I had been on my knees in the floor of the Bell Tavern and I invited Jesus Christ to become Lord of my life. What I found out about Dr. Denman, what made him an evangelist, he went to where the lost were. He didn't wait for the lost to come to him. He went to find them. Now that is a man with the domata of evangelism. It was all over it. <coughs> now, a person with this calling, they find their responsibility is to equip the saints for the work of ministries and they are to help equip motivated teachers, exhorters and pastors in the churches to fulfill the Great Commission. That drives an evangelist. He wants to see other people do the Great Commission to go ye. He wants to be these other motivational gifts to help those with the calling to be able to do this work that God has for them. They bring the lost to Christ while these other offices discipline their converts. See, that's what the other four gifts do. Well, actually, the other three. They disciple. They disciple what the other three gifts produce. Now, what about the ministry of the pastor? Well, those who have been called to the ministry of the pastor have been gifted to minister to the hurts and cares of those in the church and lead them as a shepherd in the ways of God. You see, pastors work best as leaders of local congregations. Now, some, some, but not all pastors tend to be excellent counselors. The best pastors are tolerant and empathetic. And we would have no churches if it was not for the pastors. If you're listening to me today and you have the dramatic gift of the pastor, I honor you. Thank you for your service. I can assure you that now. Well, my time has run out. In fact, I've run over. But thank you for being present, being with us today. I'd like to 